Indeed, this is the gospel. It is not our works and salvation. It is all through the great work of Christ on the cross. Indeed, this table that we will partake in in just a few moments reminds us of that. If you do not have a sermon outline, please lift your hand and these kind gentlemen will be glad to give you one. I want to encourage you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Micah. First of all, you may want to go to your table of contents. Turn to the table of contents. And by the way, this morning I know that very often I print the text um, of the main passage on our outline this morning. I have not done that, so you will need your Bible open this morning. There is a pew Bible that's there in front of you. Turn to the table of contents and look up where Micah is and then turn there in the book of Micah. And I would encourage you to maybe put a ribbon there for the next couple of months um, where you can easily get there as we study. Um, The bookstore has in it um, a very interesting copy of the scriptures. Um, I I love the, the scripture in different forms. Some of the minor prophets have been put into journal format like this. So this one is Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. And both of these are available. Uh, they're, they're only $2 each. They're great to have um, if you're wanting to take the word in a little bit larger form and maybe even be able to take some notes, take it to work with you or take it to school with you. And uh, let me just remind you that as we study on Sunday mornings as a church family together, these sermons and this series will mean so much more to you, and especially with what I'm going to do today, I'm going to really equip you to start reading the book of Micah over and over again. It's only seven chapters long. You can read it in less than an hour, but I'm going to encourage you to start reading the, the book of Micah so much so that you become very familiar with it. And as you become familiar with it, as we study it and explain it and proclaim it as a church family, I believe that the powerful words of this little prophet is going to have a huge impact. Who would like one of these? Who would like one of these? Who would, you want one of these, Jerry? Jerry, you can have one of these right there. And uh, Lucas, will you give this to Miss Beverly for me? I would appreciate that. So um, just for the asking. So um, I want to encourage you to stop by the bookstore and see what all is available there. Um, I'm excited about this study. It is a glorious, glorious study for us. So um, notice here with me, Micah, God's judgment and mercy. Part of what we're going to do today is um, very quickly review these main bullet points that were from last week, and then we're going to continue to look at material that helps us understand the whole picture of Micah's judgment Um, and Micah's mercy that he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed. And let me remind you that this indeed is God's judgment and mercy. It's God used Micah, used Micah, Micah chapter 3 tells us, filled with the Holy Spirit, he used Micah to proclaim these words. In fact, remember with me in Micah chapter 1 and verse 1. This is very important. We, we look at this little letter written many, many, many years ago, and even before the New Testament, we look at this and we say, what does this have to do with me? Well, let me show you the first hint of that. Number one, look what it says. Let's read the first few words out loud together of Micah 1, 1. What does it say? The word of the Lord that came to Micah. Let's say that again. The word of the Lord that came to Micah. You see, these are God's words. This isn't Micah's words as much as far more it is God's word. And what does his name mean? You remember with me that we said Micah, his own name means in Hebrew, who is like Yahweh or who is like the Lord. And that's, that's the, the whole picture of what he's giving us is the high and holy God of all creation. Notice this and fill these in. He, or I believe I've left them filled in for you. He was a small time preacher in a little town in the country. And he preached for 25, really, and some scholars would say for as much as 40 years. We're not sure exactly how long, but somewhere between 25 and 40 years around 700 B.C. And he was preaching at the same time of the big town prophet Isaiah, who was in Jerusalem. 
Now, as we think about these words that Micah preached, you know, very often we've skipped this. We've only read a few verses out of Micah around Christmas time that talk about the fact, the prophecy of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And we'll, we'll, we'll be reminded of that a little bit as we go here, but we, we, we often don't know exactly what to do with many of the minor prophets. But think about this with me, church family. Micah was a man of God who preached for somewhere between 25 and 40 years. And his message is condensed to these seven chapters. And not only did God used Micah in his day, in the life of Hezekiah and the life of others that we see around him. But God has used Micah's proclamation for over 2,700 years because this is the word of God. I think of the great reformational expositor and theologian, John Calvin. And notice on the screen what John said about this. He said, what took Micah some 38 to 40 years to preach. So Michael, John Calvin believed he preached longer than you. He said, what took Micah some 38 to 40 years to preach, we can read in an hour or less. How immense our ingratitude if seeing that Micah labored all his life to exhort the people of his era and that God has so graciously provided a brief summary of his teachings for us that we should fail to esteem them or neglect to cast our eyes on them. Calvin poignantly is saying to us, we ought to pay attention to what Micah wrote. This is the, words of, the word of God. These are the words of God. We need to begin to, as we study the Bible, maybe you're new to all this. You say, well, I, I really don't know a lot about the difference even between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I would say just keep coming, keep studying. We're proud that you're here. And we're proud that you would come and that you would begin to let God's word flow over you. And as we teach the history, as we teach the, the layout of what God has been doing, we see that his words are worth our attention. Notice back on your outline there, he preached against the sins of idolatry and injustice in Judean society, society, and he preached for two things. What? He preached for what? Repentance and what? Righteousness. Turning away from sin and turning to the holiness of God. You see, God used Micah to bring King Hezekiah to repentance. And God used Micah's message to save the life of Jeremiah a hundred years later. God uses Micah's message to proclaim the coming Messiah and his eternal reign. We see those prophecies in Micah. God uses Micah's message to give God's people hope of pardon and restoration. My friends, we need Micah. We need these words. Well, I want us to go back and look at some of the key realities of part of Micah's, Micah's words. It, there is both extreme, extensive judgment proclaimed in this book, and there's extreme, extensive mercy proclaimed in this book. Both are here. And, you know, it's interesting. We, we live in a day and time when we, we oh, oh, I really like the mercy passages. Oh, I really like the grace passages. I love the he loves me passages. But friends, we, we would do well to notice this. Number one, one of the key realities about God's judgment is this. Our society has a totally deficient understanding of God's judgment. We, we have a total, our whole society has a deficiency in this. And I would extend this not just to the whole society, but by and large, to the modern church, we have a deficient understanding of God's judgment. We would need to recognize that God's judgment is seen throughout the Bible. And why? Because the grand picture is, is that God is a holy God and we have turned away from God. We have gone our own way and we have gone to that which is not of God. We have gone to sin and sin has pervaded the human context. And because of this great guilt before God, 
Because of this great rejection of God, it is his judgment that causes us to see the need for him. You see, this totally deficient understanding of God's judgment is first of all seen in that it is unknown. Fill that in. But largely, people don't even know about the judgment of God. They don't realize the fact that God judges sin. They don't realize, if we, we, we just in increasingly in the world today, there's a very little understanding of all of that, and very little knowledge of it. It's unpopular. What is known about it, very often, is, it's just unpopular. We, we choose something else. We change the channel. We skip the verse. That's very often what happens. And in doing so, we warp the Scripture in our minds and in our understanding. We skew it toward the things that we prefer because it is unpopular. In fact, it seems obtuse in this present day and time for people to preach the judgment of God. It seems out of place. It seems obnoxious to many. How about this? Not only is it unknown and unpopular, it's underestimated. We've tamed God into a God that seems manageable in our minds and our hearts. Not only if we, if we kind of chose not, ah, he doesn't really, he doesn't really think. I mean, I know it says that, but isn't that hyperbole? I mean, I mean, he doesn't really mean that, does he? You know, that's very often what we do, we, we begin to conflate the world's understanding of who God is and confuse it. How about this? God's judgment, this is perhaps one of the most important ones in this present day and time, is maligned. God's judgment is maligned. God's judgment is, is said to be bad. It's said to be wrong. If I do believe it, if I do look at it, if I do see it, I would say, oh, well, that, that means God is bad. How could God make such a statement? How could God make such a judgment? How could God do such a thing? I've put below that De Deuteronomy 32 and Revelation 19, and I want you to see both of these passages, and they're on the screen in front of you. Revelation 19 first. Look what it says. And remember with me, these are the part of the last chapters of the Bible. So at the very end, when we've seen John's revelation and the big picture of what God is going to do, look what it says at the end, in the climax of it all, going into the next era of eternity. Look what it says in verse 1. After this, I heard, this is John speaking, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out. We just sang it. Let's read it. What does it say? Hallelujah. That was very weak. Let's do it again. Hallelujah. Now do it like you're in heaven. Hallelujah. Right? So this is what John hears. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to God. Look at the next part. For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. You say, the great prostitute. This is, this is the great world system of rejecting God that prostituted itself to other gods instead of remaining faithful to its creator God. And so whether it be the apostate church or whether it be the world system of rejection of God, either one, we see here that there is a proclamation that he is holy and just in his judgment of that which has rejected him. Look at Deuteronomy 32 on the screen. Deuteronomy 32, I often quote this passage. This is one of my anchor passages. I would encourage you to memorize this passage. Look what it says, for I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. Look what it says next. His work is perfect, and for all his ways are what? Justice. A God of faithfulness, and without injustice, good and upright is he. When you don't understand the work and the judgments of God, when you don't understand the vortex and the power of sin that comes sailing against your life and the difficulty and the hardship of this life. Listen, 
You need to have some rock verses that you go back to that remind you that God is good, even when you don't understand. That's what Deuteronomy 32 has been for me. Time and time again, I trust in the proclamation of his infallible, inerrable, beautiful word that tells me, you may not see it now, but understand, he is good. And that's part of faith. That's part of the faith journey. Notice here with me as we blast on. Not only is our society totally deficient in understanding of God's judgment, but number two, God's judgment reveals the sinfulness of man and the holiness of God. We should not skip the judgment passages of Scripture because we don't like them or because we don't understand them. To do so brings us in peril. It is a warped understanding of who God is and who we are and our need for a Savior. We live in a day and time when some churches feel like they're doing a service by watering down the judgments of God and elevating the mercies of God. But let me just say to you that this next statement helps us see that that doesn't work. You can't do that. Look at number three. A deficient, and circle the word deficient, a deficient understanding of God's judgment leads to a cheap understanding of God's mercy and grace. You see, if you don't understand the holiness of God and his wrath against that which is unholy, his utter rejection of that which is unholy, and his condemnation of that which is unholy, if you don't understand those things, then you can't truly understand how great his grace is and how great his mercy is. Notice number four with me. A healthy, circle the word healthy, a healthy understanding of God's judgment leads to a rich understanding or a full understanding of God's mercy and grace. So if you really want to savor the mercy of God, if you really want to savor the grace of God, then you need to go and truly, deeply consider the judgment of God. You see, this is, this is part of how it is safe to study all of Scripture. This is part of what happens when we, when we have true biblical theology and, and theology that, that comes completely together around taking the whole counsel of the Word of God together. It's, it's much safer for us to do that. Notice the next part here, the prophecy of Micah. What did he say? How did it, how did it work out? We want you to see here, first of all, that there are three prophecy cycles in Michael. The whole book of Micah is made up of three prophecy cycles. And this is, this is an important, notice what it says there, a cycle of judgment and mercy. Now, these aren't necessarily um, in chronological order playing out with the nation of Israel and God's people. But we see that Micah, over a period of time, is preaching and showing us that God, as he deals with his people, there is the judgment of sin but praise God, he's a God of mercy. His judgment is no doubt harsh. His judgment is no doubt complete. But praise God that in fact, his mercy overcomes his judgment. And his mercy, listen to this, comes through his judgment. They are interrelated. As he comes and heals the human condition of our brokenness, God's mercy is that he is working through his judgments and his judgments do not overcome his mercy. His mercy overcomes his judgments. Notice here with me the setting. The people of God are in rebellion and have sinned against God. They have sinned against him. But there's an outcome that God's mercy prevails in and over his judgment for those who are his own. 
I want you to see these three cycles very quick. Have your Bible in hand there. And there's, there's three times that we get an indicator from Micah's writing here. And it's, the first one is in Micah chapter 1 and verse 2. And everybody look at chi- chapter 1 and verse 2. What is the first word, if you have an ESV especially, what is the first word in that sentence? Here. Okay, I'm going to tell you to do something. This isn't like sacrilegious. As long as you don't have a pew Bible, don't do this with one of our red pew Bibles. But if you have your own personal Bible, I would encourage you to circle the word here in your Bible. And then let's go over to chapter 3 and verse 1. I would encourage you to circle. What does it start with? Here. Okay. And then turn the page and go over to chapter 6 and verse 1. What do you see there? It starts off with here. So these three judgment cycles that Michael gives to us, that God gives to us through Micah, we see the word here. That is the indicator of each one of them. And here's the pattern, that judgment is proclaimed, and then the prevailing, mer- listen, the prevailing mercy follows it. That God is going to work And that his grace is going to be seen. And ultimately, friends, and this is important for us this morning, you see the setting. The people are in rebellion and have sinned against God, but the outcome is that God's mercy prevails in and over. And all of this is finalized in the cross. All of this is pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, it is what? It is finished, paid in full. This is where mercy comes and rescues. Notice the first first cycle that we see here, and this is chapters 1 and 2. And this will help you in your reading. When you're reading this week, I want to encourage you to have these sermon notes with you. If If you're online with us, maybe you don't know, you can go to the website. You can print out these or download these. Have them on your on your um, iPad or something along those lines where you can see these. But notice here, I, I would encourage you to have these available for you so as you're reading, you can start to hang the verses that you're reading on certain structures in this. And so it will start to make more and more sense. But the first cycle is destruction and then regathering. And that's chapters 1 and 2. We see the revelation of coming judgment. He's saying, hey folks, God is going to come and judge us himself included, judge us for Israel's sin, for our rebellion to him. And then he gives the reasons. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 are the reasons that the judgment is coming. But notice here, and if you have your Bible open with me, look at chapter 12 and verse 13. Chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. We see, fill it in, the regathering after judgment. So in case you're you're scared to go into the judgments because you, you're like, well, you know, my heart, I, I, I need to see this. and understand that there's the, the beauty of God's mercy that is going to follow. Look at verse 12, chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, I will as- surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. Now, these are the true believers in Israel. I will set them together, look what he says, like a sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. Who is that? That is the Lord Jesus. They break through and pass the gate going out by it. Jesus said that I am the door. The sheep go in and out through me. This is the picture. The good shepherd We see the prophecy of mercy here. It's not just a prophecy of judgment, but it's also a prophecy of mercy. Look at the end. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. You see, this is God going before them. This is the Lord Jesus coming and rescuing them. This is 700 years before Jesus would be born and laid in a manger, grow up, preach to us what God is all about, and then show us his love by laying down his life for our sins. 700 years before the life of Christ, we see that Micah is prophesying that God will come with his mercy and rescue us. 
you may want to put out there to the side on your outline, the good shepherd. Because this is what we see Jesus as. This is who he is. And we see chapter 2, verses 12 through 13 showing us this is the good shepherd who will gather the sheep. The second sin cycle goes like this. There's doom and then there's deliverance. And people say, well, I like the deliverance. Well, the doom? Listen, we'll learn much if we remember that God is a holy God. We'll we'll do better if we see that we are a sinful people in need of deliverance. God comes and shows us our sin. The doom that is proclaimed, it's the doom for leaders that have been false leaders and false prophets and the whole city of Jerusalem without faith and adherence to God and his covenant. And indeed, they're doomed. They're doomed to destruction. There's going to be armies that come. The city is going to be sacked. The people are going to suffer. Jer- excuse me, Micah himself is going to endure this. But then there's the deliverer. The mercy ray is shown. We see that the mercy is his first coming is found in, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, and then his second coming. Can you take your Bible and turn over there to Micah chapter 5? I want you to see this. This is what we often read at Christmas, and that's very important. You know, your Christmas is going to be more meaningful in December because of what we've studied here in October. Notice this with me. He says in chapter 5 and verse 2, but you, O Bethlehem, Epaphra, who are too little to be named, or too little among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be, look what it says, ruler in Israel, whose going forth is from of old. What does it say next? He's called the ancient of days. You see, that means. That's pointing to the eternal past of the second person of the Trinity, Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be born in Bethlehem, and he is going to be the one who will redeem us. Look at verse 3. Therefore he shall give him up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. This is... Savior is going to bring God's people home. And so there's doom, but there is deliverance. Look at chapter 5 and verse 4. Look what it says here. And in fact, we could read all the way to verse 15, the rest of the end of the chapter, but the rest of chapter 4 and all the way through is the picture of his second coming. He came the first time, to save his people from their sin, he will come the second time to inaugurate the next stage of his kingdom, which is the glorious remnant being delivered and saved from our sins for all of eternity. So the first cycle, the second cycle, look at the third cycle. There are denunciations, that's indictments, that's condemnations, they're denunciations. And what? Salvation. Micah 6 and 7, that's what these last two chapters are about. It's God's indictments, and there's two of them. It goes, God indicts, Israel replies, God indicts, Israel replies. So there's two indictments and there's two replies. We see those in chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, and 6, 9 through 16. God is saying, here's the problem, and here's here's what you've done that is evil and wrong, and Israel seeking to respond. And then we see the book ends with God's exaltation and salvation of his people. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I will lift you up. The other nations of the world will see who you are. And we're talking about God's people. There's coming a day when all who have rejected God and all who have rejected Christ will finally see that God prevails on his throne in heaven And he has a people who are his own. And they will see that. 
This is the picture of God's exaltation and his salvation. But So I just want you to notice, I want to be very clear here, as you begin to read this, as you begin to study this little book of Micah, as you do read the heavy, profound, disturbing judgments, I want you to see, fill this in, in every cycle, God's mercy prevails. It's not just present. It's not just a counteraction. Listen, for God's people, he prevails in mercy. His mercy overwhelms his judgment. And this is the amazing gospel of Christ. What are the results of God's word through Micah? Very quickly, number one, we see that God is serious about everybody's sin. He's serious about everybody's sin and his holiness. It's not just the pagans who reject God outright and don't know his name. Listen, it's those who are his own people who still disobey and rebel. And if, let me just tell you, that if God is going to judge his own people who call him their God, you can rest assured he is going to judge those who reject him. So we, we see this here, and we see this throughout all the prophets. We see our sin in his holiness. Number two, we see that God's judgment is real, and it's terrifying. Look with me in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. I want you to see this. Right at the beginning of the first judgment cycle, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, in your Bible. Notice there, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Giving you a minute to get there. Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and he will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. Those are the places of idolatry. And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like water pours down a steep place. All that is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. You see, these are God's people who are being judged. It's not just the Assyrians and the Babylonians and these Phoenicians and all of the others that are against God and against God's people. Listen, if God is going to judge his own people, how much more will he judge the sins of the earth? He says, verse 6, therefore I will make Samaria a heap. It's the capital of Israel. And I will make an open country and a place of planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and cover and uncover her foundations. All her carved images will be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she has gathered them. And to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. You see, this is a certain real and terrifying judgment. In fact, if you look at verses 8 and 9, notice that it's so terrifying that the the Micah, the prophet of the Lord says, for this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentations like the jackals. This We read that last time as we, as we look at this. He is crying out in anguish over God's judgment of his people. And then look at verse 9. For her wound is what? Incurable. That's probably worth underlining in your Bible. Her wound is incurable. You can't fix it. It won't heal. There's a judgment that is coming that will be a mortal failure for life. And this incurable wound has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. So the capital of Israel, the capital of Judah, both of those kingdoms judged by God. And it is an incurable wound that God strikes all the way down to death and condemnation. And here we come to see that the beautiful picture of this table is that God would take that incurable wound that we deserve upon himself. 
That is the meaning of the cross. That is the meaning of the bread and the cup. Is that God takes our sin. That which was incurable, he cures. Not through anything that we would do, but through everything that he would do. And number three is this. The results of God's word in Micah is that we see God's messengers care enough for people to warn them and call them to God. We just read it. In verse 8, Micah is declaring it. He is crying out. He is weeping and he is wailing. He is standing in the street, stripped and naked, and he's saying, everybody listen! Judgment is coming. It's not okay. You're not okay. You know, if you know that everything is not okay, how much do you have to hate someone to not tell them that they're in trouble with God and that they need a Savior? You say, well, they might think I'm weird. They might, they might you know, they might think I'm odd that I talk about God. Listen, friends, this is convicting to my own heart. Why would we ever hesitate to look at people and say, you know, the world's gone crazy. You can see it in the news. You can see it in our own hearts. My own heart. I look in my own heart and I, I just know I'm not like God. And I, I need his forgiveness. I need his healing. Do you know of his healing? Are you aware that without God, we are doomed? Are you aware that without God, there's going to be a judgment? A little verse to remember is in Hebrews chapter 9. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We will be judged when we stand before God. And what will the verdict be? We've just talked in starting point. You can't be good enough for God. You have to be made new. You have to be born again. And that comes through the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. You see, God's messengers care enough for people to warn them and call them to God. And I put underneath that that this is a very personal thing. This is, there is a personal nature of God's judgment and his mercy. We read just a moment ago verse 6. And if in verse 6 you look at it, it says, therefore I will make Samaria a heap in the open country. I will pour down her stones into the valley. I will lay waste, verse 7. I will, God is doing these things. It is God's judgment against these things. This isn't merely just the idea of, well, you know, you do the wrong thing, you kind of, what goes around comes around, and you wind up paying for it. No, the picture, the picture is very clear that God personally is judging. But we see that God is not only personally judging, we also see that God is personally rescuing. Personally rescuing. Look at verse number four on your outline. We see that God will keep his covenants with Abraham, Moses, and David, and all of Israel by gathering and saving his people forever. That's what Micah is all about, that God is keeping the promise and the covenant that he made with Abraham. He's keeping the promise and the covenant he made with David. Each one of these covenants expands. Moses, David, and then all of Israel. God comes and he keeps this covenant. And he fulfills it in Christ. How does he fulfill it? Notice this with me. How did God fulfill his covenant promise of mercy? One way. Only one way. Through Jesus Christ. God's suffering servant this is the suffering rescue of God this is God coming and doing what you could never do this is God coming in healing the incurable wound this is the beauty of the gospel that God would come and lay down his life 
I don't know of a more appropriate chapter for us to read moments before remembering his death and resurrection except Isaiah 53. Remind, let me remind you that Isaiah is a contemporary. He is at the same time as Micah. And so Isaiah is preaching much, much longer. Notice these chapters, 53 and on, onwards. Micah only has seven little chapters. Isaiah 53, put out there to the side there. You know, we, we say the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the, this, the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. Isaiah 53 is the gospel according to Isaiah. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 700 years, again, before he would be born, we see Isaiah 53 exactly describing the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. Look at verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You see, God's arm is revealed. Look at verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. This is the Messiah being born into a nation that was dead in their religiosity. They were dead in their spirituality. They were not alive. They were, they were dead in their faith. Like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised. So the, so the idea is that, that even in all of his preaching and all of his teaching, people was like, that is disgusting. We esteemed him not. Nevertheless, look at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, rejected by God. This man must be rejected by God, they said, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Look what it says. Read it out loud. And with his wounds. We are healed. You see, the wounds of Christ are what forgive your sin. With his wounds, we are healed. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But look at this, circle it. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that was let that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. You see, the picture is he goes all the way to death. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Do you remember two thieves or two criminals on either side of Jesus? One says, if you're really God, why don't you get us out of this mess? Mocking him as we see here. But there was a man on the other side of Jesus that said, you and I deserve what we have coming to us. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. You see, one is a rejection the other one is an acceptance. One recognizes the Lord who forgives and redeems. He said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your Father's kingdom? And Jesus looked at him and what did he say? Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 10, yet it was the will of God to crush him. Wow. He has put him to grief. When his, soul makes it, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of God shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, 
he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's what Jesus does. He gives us his righteousness. We are accounted righteousness. It is put into our account. He gives it to us. And he shall bear their iniquities. Look at verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and, has, and was numbered with the transgressors. Let's read it out loud together. Verse 12 at the end. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Brothers and sisters, the judgment of God is overwhelmed by the mercy of God. If judgment often seems harsh and it seems unbearable, listen, the beautiful picture is that the mercy is more glorious. You see, a high view of God's holiness and a high view of God's judgment can bring to us a higher view of his mercy and his grace because he overcomes that. Indeed, look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, that's God the Father, he, God the Father, made him, that's God the Son, so the Father makes the Son to be sin who knew no sin. Circle those words, to be sin. The sinless becomes sinful. Christ the sinless becomes sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And here's the picture. God takes our sin upon the, the pure and beautiful Savior. And he takes that sin all the way to condemnation. And he takes, God takes the wrath, his own wrath, and pours it out on himself for us. Showing us that it's not by your works that you can be saved, but all by his. And this is why God is offended when we say, God, let me do this to overcome this. Let me do this to pay for that. Instead, he calls us to come in faith through the glorious mercy found at the cross. We're going to take a few moments and consider this glorious mercy of Christ. We're going to sing of it. We're going to consider it. And we're going to allow God to remind us of his great price paid for our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that where sin abounded grace abounded more. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for being such a holy and righteous God. A God of justice who cannot deny himself, but also a God of mercy who indulges himself. Lord, forgive us for the many times when we skip over your judgments. We think lightly of them. Lord, we often wink at our sin. We often excuse it, rationalize it, avoid thinking about it. Lord, I thank you that you led Micah to not ignore the sin of Israel, the sin of Judea. Father, I thank you that he proclaimed that there's a holy God 
that demands his people be righteous. And he declared to us that we have an incurable wound that only the Savior can heal. Lord, I pray that we too would embrace this great truth, that we would come to the Savior, remember his sacrifice that makes all things new. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me.